So what we're going to start with is uh, something called rebus puzzles. Um, rebus puzzles are a visual representation of a common phrase. So it's a little abstract until you see it, uh, but we're going to do a couple of practice ones. Now you can feel free to answer to yourself. You can use the chat box if you like, however you want. Uh, but we'll go ahead and uh, do a couple of practice ones and then we'll go to the expert round. So the first one, and again, it's a visual representation. Think of a common phrase, okay? So here's our first one. All right, so that, look at the color, look at the word. So Ariel or Emmy, either of you want to give it a shot? Oh, looks like we have well, some someone people. just know. Yeah, someone just got the answer. Red herring. All right, red herring. All right, <laughs> let's try one <laughs> more practice. That was quick. All right, anyone who wants to type Thank in the chat so box? Much. Give you a second there. That, one, that one's pretty easy. All right, so this one is Emmy or Ariel. Oh, Kenny got it. Top, Top secret. secret. Right on. Okay, so now that we're done with the softball questions, here's the expert round. Okay, let's see. Ooh, tough one. Yeah, Emmy. what do you see there? It's half gone. I think I know what it is. Let's see. Anyone want to give it a shot? Half hearted. All right. Ooh. All right. Next one. Look at the size of this. Why is it so tiny? What's <laughs> going on here? Oh, someone got it. Small talk. Nice. Small talk. All right. Now we're getting to the real expert round. A couple more this here. Ooh. How many of these do you see? And where is it placed exactly? Yeah. Hmm. It's not in the middle. Cover. Looks like it's on the side. I don't uh, know that one. There are two. It's a tough one, Edith. Well, you know, it is after lunch, and I don't know if everyone has had their afternoon coffee yet. So, <laughs> all right. So it's we've got two of them. So it's two air, and they're on the. Right side, right. so we have to err on the right side. Yeah, the last it. one, last but not least. I don't know that expression. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll just have to, uh, maybe you don't usually err on the right side. I don't know. <laughs> All right, and the last one, even tougher, I think. Um, I see the word deep. And where is deep? Deep in thought. Uh, All right, good. <laughs> Wonderful. So hopefully everyone's brains are a little more awake. Um, and we are now going to go ahead and dive in, and I'll hand it over to Emmy. Great. That was a really great activity. Thanks, Edith. So water. To give you guys the full context of water and current issues surrounding water issues in uh, so, sorry current issues surrounding water conservation in LA. Um, we're going to start with a little history lesson. So the story begins in 1781 when the first Spanish settlement, El Pueblo de Los Angeles, was founded. And during this time, the people living in, in Los Angeles, um, the population of which was less than 2,000, um, got all of their water by diverting it from the LA River. They did this by digging ditches and creating water wheels and building dams. and that's the way they diverted water from the LA River. And they did this within the first month of um, establishing the settlement. Um, all the community workers came together and just created you know, these ditch, ditches. And this was the first aqueduct system. And this distribution system of ditches, dams, and water wheels was what was used for both domestic purposes and agricultural irrigation. And it was this water supply from the LA River that made the survival and growth of the community um, possible. So this original aqueduct, which is a pipe or channel that is used to bring water to an area um, that, was, that carried water from the LA River, was used for over 100 years until it was abandoned around 1904. And by this time, the population of LA was, had grown to over 100,000 people. And when I say the LA River, I'm referring to the major river in LA County that flows 50 miles from Western San Fernando Valley throughout uh, downtown Los Angeles and the gateway cities to where it escapes into the ocean in Long Beach. And today you might know it as something that looks something like this. 
So I work with students in middle and high school. And oftentimes, you know, when we talk about the LA River, students are not even aware that we have like uh, an LA River. And then you show, I show them a picture of this, this river and they're like, oh, that's a river. And, you know, that's understandable because it doesn't really look like the typical river that you would imagine. And the reason being is that, you know, it's been channelized, it's been encased in, in, in concrete, but it didn't always look like that. And back in the day, it did look like a real river with thick, shrubby, riparian vegetation. There's a photo of, of the LA River before it was channelized um, right, right here. And as you can see, it's like a real living river that meanders and flows and expands and shrinks like a real river does. And there was a lot more species diversity than what you find today. I think there were actually like many species that went extinct that were only found in this region. Um, so you might be wondering why did the people in LA decide to channelize it and make it look like the way it looks today and you know covering concrete? Well, to explain, you have to understand that LA is part of the Mediterranean climate zone. So this means that our climate is subject to short wet winters and long dry summers, as I'm sure you're all aware. And this includes occasional heavy rains over short periods of time. And when this happens, moderate flooding with severe damage can occur. And this happened when um, LA saw the biggest flood in the history of LA in 1938, when over 10 inches of rain was seen in five days, it left a third of LA flooded, um, damaging many people's homes and properties, and it caused actually 115 fatalities. And at the time, that was a really big number. That was a big chunk of the population. There were other smaller but still devastating flooding events that happened around the same time. And the public just started demanding flood control and they um, blamed the LA River as being the culprit of these you know, detrimental flooding events. And that led to the decision to channelize the river. So, Channelization began in 1938, which was the same year that this major flood happened. So I'm sure you can imagine like the, the pressure that, it, that the government had to, to channelize a river. And it was a huge, huge engineering project that took over 20 years. And when it was completed in 1960, it formed a 51 mile engineered channel, mostly lined with concrete. And to give you an idea of just how big, big of an engineering project this was, by the end of the construction, um, workers had removed roughly 800,000 dump truck loads worth of earth and constructed the channel with 3.5 million barrels of cement and 147 million pounds of steel. So as I mentioned earlier, um, much of the species diversity and the natural ecosystem was altered and you know, this is why. But you know, it, it was for the greater good of the people and the LA River being channelized is part of the greater county flood control district that encompasses 85 cities in the county and more than 3000 square miles um, of land. It includes a drainage system in every single watershed, including 500 miles of open channel, which includes the LA River, 2,800 miles of underground storm drain, which I'm sure some of you have seen these large um, pipes um, that you know carry water and escapes into the ocean, and an estimated 80,000 catch basins, which I'm sure everybody has seen these catch basins are everywhere. They actually carry the water into these storm drains and channels. So the water that travels in these storm drains and channels directly escapes into the ocean and doesn't go to a treatment facility or doesn't go to like a filtration plant at all. It is designed to quickly move the water directly from the top of the watershed, you know, from the mountains down into the ocean in order to prevent flood flooding. And it does that really well. You know, this drainage system was designed to move water really fast, efficiently through the watershed to prevent floods. And it does that. But there are some downsides. There's some negative consequences to um, all this concrete and all of and the drainage system, basically. And the biggest um, change that it, it um, has is that it prevents the storm water, which is the rainwater and the snow and all of that, it prevents that water from sinking into the ground, which is really important for watershed health. And actually Edith is gonna explain more of that later. But also in addition to that, when, the, when large volumes of water moves through these drainage systems, it also carries and picks up litter, debris, 
um, chemicals, oil, trash, and other pollutants that severely affect the water quality. And it actually carries it directly to the ocean. So today, the LA River has been channelized and it no longer supplies all of LA residents with our water needs. And I'm gonna pass it on to Edith to talk about where we get our water supply today. All right, so uh, the story that you just heard from Emmy is the story of a city that sort of got, uh, you know, uh, detached from its, its history sort of, uh, you know, uh, no longer had this connection to, to its own resources. Um, and as we grew as a region and as a city, we began to look elsewhere for water. So I'll share with you um, some information about where uh, the vast majority of our water currently comes in terms of imported sources. Um, the first source that LA began to tap into is uh, the green and yellow lines that you see there. This is the LA aqueduct. And this is water that began to flow down to Los Angeles in 1913, just about a uh, lo little over a hundred years ago now. And just think that at that time, we had 200,000 people living in Los Angeles. And today, just in the city, we have 4 million. In the county, we have 10 million. And in our region, we have more than 20 million people in Southern California. And this is all due to the existence of water. Because as Emmy mentioned, we are in a Mediterranean climate and we're subject to uh, wild fluctuations in availability of water throughout the year. Um, so where does this particular water uh, come from? So the LA aqueduct water um, is, uh, it comes to us from the Eastern Sierra Nevada mountains, which is a uh, pristine, beautiful place uh, for uh, backpacking among other things. And it produces uh, some of LA's uh, and California's most reliable water source. Um, the water flows through the Owens Valley and if you are a resident of the city of Los Angeles, um, I'd like you to know that you are an owner of land up in the Owens Valley. Um, little uh, did you know, the people of the city of Los Angeles, which includes its residents, own more land in the Owens Valley than the entire footprint of the city of Los Angeles. What this means is if you drive up Highway 395 today, you'll see a few of the towns that have existed there for a long time, including Independence, Lone Pine, Big Pine. And um, these cities, these towns, really have not been able to expand beyond their, uh, their historic footprints because uh, the city of Los Angeles has essentially uh, prevented that. If you uh, love the pristineness of nature, you might really appreciate that there are largely untouched areas there. Uh, but from an economic development standpoint, it doesn't make for, uh, for a great, uh, you know, sort of decision. So it's been a very contentious uh, relationship with that part of the state uh, now for over 100 years. Um, the second uh, uh, imported source that we began to draw from is the Colorado River, which is this uh, purple line that goes east-west. And this uh, particular... Uh, watershed is, is among the most oversubscribed uh, water sources in the entire world. Uh, seven states uh, are reliant upon this water source, as well as numerous Native American tribes and Mexico. And in fact, most years, water from the Colorado River does not reach the Gulf of California here to the south because it's been sucked up uh, in, in the northern parts of it. Um, the allocations for the Colorado River were made in the 1940s, which uh, was in an uncharacteristically wet period. And so those allocations are really uh, more of a dream than a reality. California has the largest allocation amongst all of the states. And this too has produced some contentious relationships with some of our neighboring states, for example, Arizona, which has been growing in recent years and would like to see more of a portion of the river go to uh, toward supporting its residents. Finally, we have this red line, which is the Colorado, uh, I'm sorry, the California aqueduct. 
And the California aqueduct brings water from the Bay Delta. So that's the Delta that is uh, that comes together when the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers uh, dump into, into uh, this, this bay near San Francisco Bay. Uh, this is a uh, really complex ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's also a, a very important agricultural um, region for, uh, for that part of the state. And what's remarkable about this aqueduct, which, which became operational in the 1970s, is that it's the longest in the world. Um, and it also has the highest lift of water in the world. So in order to bring this water uh, into Los Angeles, water has to be lifted 2,000 feet uh, just north of Los Angeles in the Tehachapi Mountains. Um, that water lift constitutes the single largest demand mm -hmm. of electricity in the state mm -hmm. of California. Uh, again, I'm going to repeat that because it's quite a remarkable uh, you know, fact. The largest single demand in electricity in the state of California is to bring that water up into Los Angeles. So let's, uh, let's take a look at, uh, now that you know that some portion of LA's, city of LA's water supply is imported, take a guess as to how much of it. We heard from Emmy that most of it, uh, really all of it, was uh, at the beginning of, of our city's history, was, uh, came from, from the LA River, but now that's no longer the case. So you can feel free to Type your answer in the chat box. Uh, you can put A, B, C, or D. So what percent of the city of LA's water supply do you think is imported? Is it 10 to 20%? Is it 40 to 50? Is it 80 to 90? Or is it all of it? Is it 100? Do we no longer get any of our water? So I'll just give you a few seconds there to type your answer in or to ponder your answer as you scratch your head and contemplate what a wonderful learn at home activity you're in the middle of right now. <laughs> and let's see. So the answer here is 80 to 90. Wow, everybody got it right. That's yeah, incredible. we got some smart people in this Great job yeah. today. <laughs> wonderful. So uh, historically in the, in the you know, recent past, it's been about 85 to 90%. Now, why is that not a good idea? So there are a variety of reasons why uh, this model of us relying on imported water is really not something that we can sustain into the future. And I'll just go over some of these. So legal decisions are one reason. So I mentioned the San Joaquin Sacramento River Delta, and um, there are. This is a very ecologically important uh, region. And there are legal decisions that have been made due to the Endangered Species Act in order to prevent further damage from happening ecologically in that area. Climate change is another reason. So here are two uh, pictures of Lake Oroville, which is one of the state's most important um, reservoirs. And what you see is Lake Oroville just a couple of years apart. And this isn't a shot that's taken from the same angle. And you can see that this marina on the left is essentially gone on the right. Inefficient use of water is another. Uh, the Central Valley of California serves really as the breadbasket for much of the United States. Uh, we have 80% uh, of the state's water which goes toward agricultural uses. And that water is largely subsidized. And there um, it hasn't been a huge incentive for there to be more efficient types of irrigation practices adopted and, and even uh, you know, more uh, thoughtful decisions with regard to crops that are, dis uh, that are grown in the area. Finally, you see resource depletion on the right here. This is Owens Lake, so you heard about Owens Valley by now. Um, Owens Lake was a navigable lake up until the time that we began to import water into LA in the beginning of the 20th century. Now it is largely a uh, dust bed, and what occurs is that there are pretty strong wind events that happen in the Owens Valley, and all of that dust becomes airborne, causing tremendous uh, air quality issues for the residents, both uh, human residents and, and flora and fauna in the area. Now, all of these reasons that you see 
uh, are true and were true even before we consider the recent fluctuations in drought conditions in the state of California. And here I'm going to show you um, how California has fared with regard to drought um, relative to the last couple of years. So here you see the most recently uh, released of these. Um, so on April 7th, just a few days ago, we see that um, that LA County here, uh, just a small tip of it uh, is now considered abnormally dry. Most of Southern California has actually seen a uh, fairly wet March and April. So we're not considered to be in drought during this period, but Central and Northern California are considered, as you can see, largely in moderate drought. So this is this year, just a few days ago. Let's go back a year. This is April 9th. Uh, so just one year ago, we see that virtually the entire state, it was not considered in drought and just uh, the southern tip of, of the state was considered abnormally dry, but not really in drought. And that's because we had a very, very wet winter, uh, 2018 into 2019. Now let's go back one more year. So the year before that, in April of 2018, the situation was very different with uh, virtually all of Central and Southern California in moderate, severe, or even extreme drought. Um, if I continue to go back a few more years, you would see that this type of fluctuation is fairly common for us. And um, this uh, ensures that water managers in our state have uh, work forever because uh, managing water in our state is, is a very big challenge. Now, there's this term that's begun to get, um, you know, uh, circulated. This came out of a climatologist at UCLA, and this term is climate whiplash. And what we're seeing here is that we no longer uh, can sort of rely upon these fairly long um, periods of, of consistency. And every year we really have to be uh, ready to be resilient for whatever comes next. So this prompts the question, well, doesn't, you know, LA have any local water sources? Didn't we just hear from Emmy that people were able to subsist off of waters of the LA River for many, many hundreds, if not thousands of years? And the answer is that we do have local water sources. And what you see here in this map is a representation of the groundwater basins that we have beneath Los Angeles, the major ones. Uh, groundwater is, you know, essentially think of, um, of an underground lake uh, that uh, occupies the spaces between rocks and, you know, porous spaces in sand, gravel, and soil. So uh, we happen to have these groundwater basins in Los Angeles, the largest of which is the upper LA uh, River area, San Fernando Basin. So this is under the San Fernando Valley. And actually the reason why the San Fernando Valley was annexed into the city of Los Angeles is because of the ability to, do, uh, to have water storage underneath that. Um, if you are looking for films to watch um, while you are self-isolating at home, uh, might I suggest Chinatown, which tells a fictionalized version of LA's water history and will tell you the story of, of LA and the San Fernando Valley. So um, that in turn sort of prompts the question, well, doesn't every region have the ability to do this? And the truth is that we are really fortunate in the LA area that we do have such abundant groundwater resources. As you can see here, um, our neighbor to the south, San Diego, does not have this uh, type of fortune. And in fact, they have been prompted to look toward desalination as, an, as, uh, as a way to solve their water issues. And fortunately, that is something that is not viable for Los Angeles because we have so many other opportunities and so many other sources of water that are less dis uh, destructive than desalination. So how do we reconnect our water uh, from the surface down to uh, the groundwater that we were just talking about? I like this image because um, this is a LA River on the left and you can see sort of a re-envisioned version of it. The reason why I like this image is because the one on the right doesn't look so drastically different than the one on the left. Sure, there's more vegetation and it meanders a bit more, 
But um, the point that I think this image makes is that what we're proposing is not to get rid of people. We're not saying return to nature, the city can't belong here anymore. What we're saying is there are ways for us to re uh, sort of invite nature into the city and for us to have a more symbiotic relationship again. So what you see is gray infrastructure can turn into what we call green infrastructure, which is a more sustainable approach to invite some ecosystem services, invite some birds and species uh, from flora and fauna and to uh, essentially reconnect um, the surface with the groundwater. So how do trees specifically um, serve as green infrastructure for water management. And here you can think of any kind of vegetative element. So your landscape that you have at home in your backyard or your front yard or, or on in the parkways in front of your home, how, how can that help us uh, sort of reconnect with the water cycle? Um, there are three specific uh, benefits that I want to share with you today. One is retention of rain and reduction of runoff. Another is the delay of runoff. And finally, the third is the improvement of water quality. Um, I'll, I'll break those down a little bit more in the upcoming slides. But first, let's take a quick look at what happens to rain when it hits a tree. So um, we don't stop to think about this much, but uh, trees really do serve as sort of upside down umbrellas for rain, capturing that rain instead of having it run off onto the street. So when it rains, a uh, tree uh, will first capture much of that rainfall in, its, in its, what's called its canopy, which is essentially its leaves and its bark. And uh, some of that water will be re-released uh, via evaporation or transpiration. Um, some of that water will go all the way through the tree and become, uh, you know, this, this they call it through fall. Um, it's a bit of a fancy term if you ask me. And some of that will become runoff. So that will leave the site um, in a natural system. It might go to a river or, or eventually down into the soil again. Um, but a great deal of it will go right into the soil. And you can see that this tree has lovely roots that have been creating more porous spaces in the soil. And there's uh, all sorts of critters in there that are, are helping to make this a very healthy system. And finally, that water that goes below the tree will uh, eventually recharge the water table or the groundwater. So coming back to those benefits that I had just mentioned in the previous slide, um, retaining rain and reducing stormwater runoff is, is a critical benefit, particularly in an urban area. So if you look on the left side of the screen here, we see that a typical water cycle in an undeveloped region looks something like this. Very little becomes runoff. You can see only about 10% about 40% goes back into the atmosphere, cooling this, uh, the atmosphere, and about half of it becomes infiltrated into the soil, essentially absorbed into the soil. Now, what happens when we've changed that system and developed uh, spaces, think of downtown Los Angeles, for example? Well, the big uh, issue is that we've created a, a, a massive issue in terms of how much of that water leaves the site. So we've really uh, increased that tremendously from 10 to 55 or so percent with only about you know 15 percent of water infiltrating down into the ground. So we have fundamentally changed these cycles. The second benefit is delaying runoff. So uh, delaying runoff is um, uh, something that we want to do. And if you've been looking at the news at all, you might recognize this as something that looks tremendously familiar. This is a flattening of the curve. And uh, we've been using this, uh, this kind of uh, graph for a very long time in water management. And I was struck recently when I saw that we're using it also in public health. And basically all this says is, if we slow down um, the uh, rate at which water takes to move through, through, um, through our urban areas, we will also be able to reduce 
that peak, which helps with uh, protection of life and property. Finally, improving water quality is something that we also want to be able to do. And that helps, uh, that's helped as well by trees and by green infrastructure. And here's a little, little joke with these fish saying, hey, head for the factory. Environmental regulations have made it safer. And the idea here is it's very difficult to regulate um, what are called non-point sources. That is all of the spaces in the urban uh, you know, area upstream where stormwater comes from. Your home, everybody's streets here, you know, uh, schools, et cetera. These are all spaces that are very hard to regulate. And so it's actually easier to regulate spaces like a factory, et cetera. So, uh, so those are the three primary benefits. And now we're gonna turn it back over to Emmy to take a look at uh, some of the strategies that we can use. Yeah, so as Edith mentioned, um, in an urban setting like Los Angeles, we have substantially more water ending up as runoff instead of compared to a natural setting where around half of it would naturally sink into the ground. But the good news is that um, like how trees provide benefits, there's other easy solutions and techniques to capture rainwater and improve stormwater quality. And one of the best ways to do this is to build berms and swales. If you have permission on a school ground or on your property, um, one of the best ways to harvest rainwater is to just create these depressions in, in the ground and um, allowing the water to flow and accumulate into it. And many research um, has shown that building these berms and swales improves stormwater quality um, by allowing the water to infiltrate and slowing down the flow of water. Another, um, it, Another thing you can implement in your home is a rain chain, and that's something you attach onto your roof, and it basically just slows down the flow of rain, and you can have it um, be released into a rain garden or, um, or a swale. And we have toolkits on how to do all of these, these things, which we'll get into later. So another great way to capture rainwater is building a rain garden, which is a similar concept as berms and swales, but it's um, essentially a native garden and you place rocks into, into like a, you know, into a swale and it, it looks really pretty. And we actually have a DIY video of how to build your own rain garden. And we can just show you a really short clip of the beginning to give you guys an idea. Oh, that's the rain barrel one. Today, I think that's the rain barrel one, Edith. <laughs> yeah, we'll just start with that. A rain tank at oh, okay. Great way to capture rainwater to help keep your trees and garden alive while creating a drought smart Los Angeles. Before you get started, see where water can be diverted from your roof. There's tons of possibilities. I don't know why it decides to automatically advance, but now here's, here, so that was the rain barrel one. Here's a quick uh, look at the rain gardens. Want to do your part to create a water secure LA? This simple DIY project will sink rain into the ground instead of wasting those drops to be swept away to the ocean. Where's the best place to install a rain garden? Look for places where rainwater can be redirected by using a swale or downspout extension. Pick a sunny space at least 10 feet from your home's foundation, garage, or driveway, and at least three feet from the sidewalk. Next, you'll decide how big your rain garden will be with some simple math. All right, so. Um, so now that you've heard about a few different strategies, we have a second poll for you. Uh, what strategy for inviting rain into your landscape are you most interested in? So go ahead and use the chat box. And hey, if you wanna put more than one of these, we're okay with that. You can say all of the above. We should have probably put an, uh, an, a fifth option here, but would you uh, be most interested in planting trees, removing your lawn, planting a rain garden or installing a rain barrel or rain tank. So go ahead and, um, and answer using the chat box. Again, it's planting trees, removing your lawn, planting a rain garden or installing a rain barrel. 
And then I'll turn it back over to Emmy, who's going to walk us quickly through a site assessment tool that uh, we have available for you all for download that will help you kind of determine where to put these various strategies. Yeah, so we have a lot of answers popping in. Awesome. Um, I also just wanted to add that rain barrels are really neat because they collect a lot of water. So if you have a thousand square foot in your roof, you can collect 600 gallons of water every time it rains an inch. So that is a lot of water that you can use as a free resource to um, use for your garden, to water your tree if you plant a tree. And you can find rain barrels at hardware stores right now, which are open, I believe. And um, you actually get a rebate from the city for installing a rain, rain barrel. And that could be a really fun project to do during lockdown. So if you are interested in doing any of the, um, the strategies that Edith just, just mentioned, we have a DIY site assessment tool. And this is basically a great starting point to determine what projects are suitable for your specific site, um, whether it's your home or a school, you know, wherever you have permission to do so. And you basically create a map that examines various factors like um, where are the hardscapes where water flows? Where are the landscapes where water could be infiltrated? Where are there trees or potential tree wells that could provide shade or where you could plant trees? And we have other factors to, uh, to consider, like where are there recreational areas like playgrounds or vegetable gardens where you can either extend or avoid. And we also want to be um, considerate of where the utilities are. So we don't want to um, do anything that's going to um, you know, damage a utility line or underground line or um, anything like that. So all of these things we mark into our map and you also wanna look at where the water sources are. So where are there sprinklers? Where are there faucets? And mark, marking all of these different things with um, symbols, which it's all included in this DIY tool. It's really, really simple. You just have to read through it. Um, you also wanna look at areas of sun exposure. So if you're gonna make a rain garden, um, you need to know how much sun is going to um, be available for the native plants, as well as where is the water flowing? Um, where is their slope? Where, where can water naturally flow? And you also want to evaluate the soil. So you want to make sure that if you are doing a native gar uh, rain garden, you want to make sure that the soil is going to drain properly. And here we have a simple soil drainage test. You just dig a hole and you, you pour water in it, and then you just wait to see how, how many minutes it takes for the soil to drain completely. And then it tells you whether or not it's appropriate for a rain garden. So once you have your map, and you have all of these factors um, assigned to your map, um, you can then assess um, the site for, for whatever sustainable solution you wanna choose. And that can be either um, redirecting, capturing, conserving water through rain gardens, um, bioswales, or you can replace hard surfaces maybe if you, have the, if you have the resources, maybe you can replace a hard surface with a green and permeable one. Maybe you can plant trees. And yeah, so this is a really, really neat assessment tool that um, we use with students. We also give it to families and individuals that want to do their part in conserving water. And it's, I find that it's a perfect time right now if, if you do have you know, permission, if you do own your own home, it's such a great time to, to do a project like this. And it's good for the environment. You actually also save water. You can learn about native plants and we're actually going to be having another water talk in a few weeks um, and it's going to dig deeper into these solutions. So please keep your eyes peeled for that upcoming talk, which I'm not sure when it's gonna be, but I think it's gonna be in the near future. All right. So um, we have lots and lots of other resources uh, to support um, anything that you might be considering doing of the sort. We have how-to videos, we have toolkits, um, lots of it is available at treepeople.org slash DIY. Um, you can also link to some of what we shared today by going to treepeople.org slash water. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Ariel, who I think is going to moderate 
through some questions if we have any. Yeah, thank you so much for that presentation. Very much appreciate it, Edith and Emmy. Um, there, again, we're, there are also resources on our Learn at Home. Just check out our website or shoot us an email um, at learn at home with tree people at treepeople.org. You should have gotten a calendar invite to this session from that email. You can feel free to email us if you have any questions about today's presentation. Um, so now I want to open up the floor for any questions, comments. Feel free to add them into the chat um, if you have any. And as you as you uh, look at whatever's come in there, Ariel, let me just um, make a comment about uh, the various strategies that we talked about today. Um, I just wanted to share that while it is true that it's easier to do these things if you own, um, I don't think that's necessarily an absolute requirement. And I just wanted to share that I do not own and I don't live in a single family home. My husband and I live in a multifamily uh, building um, that we've been renting. And we, uh, through conversations with our landlady, were able to get permission to plant 18 trees on the property and to install a rain barrel. So, um, you know, it all depends on what kind, of, what kind of relationship you have and what kind of, uh, you know, uh, land lord or landlady you have, but um, I encourage you to try to have those conversations. And I also wanted to just mention that uh, if you're a Southern California resident, uh, a really great resource to find out what rebates or incentives are available um, is bewaterwise.org. So bewaterwise.org is, um, is a really, really great uh, resource for you to find out if there uh, if you could get a rain barrel incentive or uh, swap out your lawn for native or climate appropriate landscaping that sort of a thing so um, check it out yes all right so we do have a couple questions um one question is are there any differences between shade trees and fruit trees when considering water retention yeah, so um, in general, um, in general, if you're thinking of water retention, um, actually, you know, in, in our kind of climate, in our Mediterranean climate, where we get most of our rain in the cool, uh, you know, fall through spring months, it actually makes the most sense to plant evergreens. Uh, if rain um, harvesting or rain, uh, you know, capture or you know, stormwater management is the thing you are looking to do the most of. Um, in terms of fruit trees, you know, fruit trees do tend to be a little bit smaller. They tend to be deciduous, which means that they lose their leaves uh, once a year or every so often. Um, shade trees can be either evergreen or deciduous. So um, Generally, they tend to be a little bit more uh, beneficial in terms of water uh, retention, uh, but you don't get fruit if you if you plant a, a shade tree. So it's, it really depends on what you're hoping to maximize in terms of benefits. You know, trees do a lot. They're they're uh, multitaskers, and um, you know, certainly planting fruit trees makes a whole lot of sense, especially nowadays. Anyone who has a garden or has fruit trees is rich in the eyes of most uh, most people around the world at this time. Yes, thank you. Um, there was also a comment that street trees are also um, a great way to think about water conservation. A lot of us have street trees outside of our buildings. Um, and we did a, a whole series last week on taking care of those street trees. But that is something just as an individual that you can do um, and I don't know if you want to comment at all, Edith, on or Emmy, on the street trees and taking care of them, and how that can also help boost our our water conservation. Yeah, so I'll I'll just mention that uh, about half of the eighteen trees that we planted on our property are actually street trees. So those are tr uh, trees that are planted in the parkway, which is the space be between the street and and the sidewalk. Um, and, um, you know, those, um, now that we've had those trees in here for a few years, they've grown tremendously and um, we see the benefit that they bring both in terms of 
water capture as well as um, as shade and not to mention all of the wildlife that they that they host. We hardly had any birds here in the middle of, of LA uh, before and now we have a, a lot so more. So many birds, oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah, we sure do. so many more of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I live in an apartment and I don't, you know, even if I wanted to like create a rain garden or plant trees, I couldn't do that. But there's other ways that we could all help um, the quality of, of our stormwater, which is simply picking up trash or um, not throwing trash in, on the street. Or there's other things we can do, like recycling motor oil, because motor oil is a huge contributor of um, pollution. And picking up dog poop is really important. Some people think it's like organic material, so it's not bad, but it, it actually is really bad. And same with actually leaf litter. And leaf litter, I recently found out that's also a stormwater pollutant. So um, yeah, just like being responsible for your own waste. How do you recycle motor oil? That's a really good question. I actually don't know, but I can look it up and get back to you. Do you know Edith or Ariel? I've never attempted to do it myself because I always bring my my vehicle to get serviced. Um, but I, I believe that there are sites uh, where you can bring it. Um, I would check. Yeah, there must with, be. I would check with, um, if you live in the city of LA, um, check with the LA City Bureau of Sanitation um, and they will be able to, uh, I, I believe they probably have a list of the places where you can bring it. Mm. I mean, it looks I like- I do know that like, um participants said you can take it to AutoZone. Very helpful. Thank you for that. Or Department yeah. of Public Works. Yeah, really helpful. Um, right. we'll, we'll, we will also do a little background research to figure that out. Um, I also saw a comment that someone said, I wish my block parks ways was filled with trees like on the picture. And I completely agree. Um, I wish my neighborhood also had trees like um, in the picture, and that's what we're all about here at Tree People. Um, we're doing when all of all of these things get back to normal. Um, you must come out and volunteer with us. We plant trees every weekend, and right now we're actually taking care of trees um, in areas where there's very low tree canopy in LA. Um, so definitely check out our volunteer events once we get back back to normal and we will share those out. All right, oh, and, and then also this, because you joined this um, session and this training, you're well on your way to becoming a community forester. And one of our trainings with community foresters is how to um, plant trees on your own block and the process of that. So um, we would love to help you in thinking through how you could do that in your own neighborhood. All right, any other questions? Like, no, thank you guys for the engagement. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm just gonna share one more thing. Um, do that now, I'm gonna take over Edith. Okay. Um, I wanted to share what our offering is for next week. Um, we're going to be doing, if everybody can see that slide. We're going to be doing an Earth Month chat with actor and eco-activist Ed Begley Jr. on Instagram Live. Um, we're very excited about this opportunity. He has been an um, environmentalist for a very long time, has a lot of tips, and is gonna share a lot of information on just how you can be um, eco-conscious these days. Um, so join us on Instagram Live, Thursday, April 23rd, next Thursday in a week at 10 a.m. Um, and we hope to see you guys there. So without further ado, we'll, we will end um, this presentation and I hope you guys all enjoyed yourselves um, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks everyone, elbow bumps. <laughs> <laughs> all right, bye everyone. Bye.